Now it's my pleasure to welcome to you the session on immunizations, understanding the risks and benefits. Uh, this morning's session will be presented by Dr. E. Richard Steen. Dr. Steen is a professor of pediatrics in the allergy, immunology, and rheumatology division at the UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine in Los Angeles. So he is also a member of uh, IDF's Medical Advisory Committee. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Steen. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Whenever you give a talk early in the morning, you're always concerned that nobody's going to show. And one time, I was asked to give a talk at uh, Armarillo, Texas, 8 o'clock in the morning. There was only one person in the audience. And <clears throat> I waited a while, but then um, time passed, and so I gave my talk. And the one person in the audience clapped and asked a good question, which I answered. And then, um, <clears throat> as I was leaving, he was saying, where are you going? I said, well, I'm going back to Los Angeles. I gave my talk. He said, you can't go. I'm the second speaker. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're going to talk about uh, a very important topic um, for immunodeficient patients, um, for contacts, which many of you are, and for yourself. And I'll start with a quotation. The impact of vaccination on the health of the world's people would be hard to exaggerate, with the exception of safe water, no other modality, not even antibiotics, have had such a major effect on mortality reduction and population growth. <clears throat> That's from uh, the textbook of vaccines. <clears throat> and to emphasize this, look at the mortality of these illnesses in uh, the 20th century versus 2011, and so that many diseases, including smallpox, have been eradicated. Um, diphtheria has been eradicated. Um, the one illness that's still around is pertussis, and we're going to have more to say about that. But many of you older people remember getting, um, being quarantined for polio um, a scare, and so vaccines are really important. <clears throat> and for example, um, measles now is making a comeback. Uh, because there's a lot of people that don't feel that they should be vaccinated for measles. And um, part of the problem is that there's so many different vaccines now that are um, recommended for all children. You can see this chart, all the yellow is the time. So there's now 17 vaccines that are recommended for normal children. So I'm going to talk a little bit about new vaccines, uh, reaching high immunization rates, and vaccine delivery. Um, and I'm going to skip this. So one quote, my favorite quote is, one mother to another, I would never give my child that dangerous influenza vaccine if he hadn't died of measles last summer. So there's types of immunity. There's natural immunity, the kind that we all have. You know, there's hundreds of diseases like dog distemper that you don't get because you don't have the reception. You have species, natural uh, immunity. Then there's active immunity. What happens when you get an illness or get a vaccine, you develop antibodies and that lasts a long time. That's active immunity. And that's often for a lifetime. But often you have to get boosted. There's passive immunity, which many of you and your parents get are giving gamma globulin and they give you antibodies, the problem is antibodies only last for two or three weeks. And the thing that's important for all of you is herd immunity. So if 95% of, of the people in the community are vaccinated against something, then that disease is going to be eradicated and so the, the disease comes not back. But when something, something be, be below 95 occurs, then the disease can occur and you don't lose losses, herd immunity. So the history of vaccines started off, uh, many of you have probably heard this story, when William Jenner noted that the scourge of the 17th century smallpox, which wiped out the American Indians and everything, um, the only patients that didn't get it were um, women that, that milked 
cows. And the reason they didn't get it is because they got sores on their hands from um, um, dealing with um, um, cowpox, which is a variant of smallpox. It's called vaccinia. And if you have, get vaccinia, then you don't get smallpox. And so in the old days, what you did is give a, 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 a vaccinia illness to a person by giving a vaccine, and that prevented smallpox, and that wiped out uh, smallpox in, in the world. Um, Pasteur, um, a, a century later, um, developed a vaccine for rabies, another fatal disease, um, but he didn't even know the virus was. He just ground up some, uh, some uh, material from a patient and, uh, and gave it, and that seemed to do the trick. And then there's been a number of other vaccines since we'll go through that. So this is a very famous picture of him immunizing this little boy. And then he was exposed to smallpox, which is very contagious. And lo and behold, he was protected. And so that's how vaccines started. Um, beforehand, the story is they had something called variolation. Actually, smallpox, the name of the disease is variola. And George Washington and a number of our founding fathers actually um, would get variolation. And they took a person with smallpox, took a little bit of their sores and gave it to themselves. They had a mild case of uh, smallpox and they were protected. And so that's called variolation. So that's um, the precursor of vaccination. This is what um, uh, smallpox looks like. It looks, doesn't look small to me, but that's what it was called because syphilis, the sores are even bigger. That was large pox. And so this is what smallpox looked like. Well, my introduction to vaccines was in uh, 1948. It was hot. I was grounded, no movies, no swimming, no trips to the store, no summer camp. I didn't have to, I didn't even do anything bad. My mother was a nurse, silenced my complaints. Do you want to spend the rest of your life in an iron lung? Um, I was allowed to go down just once to the health department for a gamma globulin shot. I didn't get polio, thanks in part to this injection, and that was gamma globulin. That prevented smallpox, that prevented polio but just for a couple of months. And then the scourge was over when uh, Salk came along and invented his vaccine and um, um, no longer a scare. Actually, my wife spent her kindergarten year in a body cast because she did get polio. So this was a thing that uh, we all saw pictures of iron lung where your head protruded from this um, area and a big baffle help, helps you breathe back and forth. So it's not a good thing to have is iron lung. And so any hospital like a Boston Children's Hospital or the hospital where I was taken care of, in the warehouse they still have these iron lungs which are just kind of historical. So um, why do we need to use current vaccines? Well, 10% of U.S. kids enter school unimmunized. Um, 55% um, of children unimmunized against influenza, and there are 131 deaths from um, uh, flu. 55% uh, of the girls between 13 and 17 do not get the HPV vaccine. As you know, that, cause, that prevents cervical cancer, and so it's a killed, inactivated vaccine, and it's a very good one. Um, a recent measles up, uh, outbreak in um, Indiana killed 38 people, and pertussis is now coming back. So uh, some general considerations we're talking about is serious allergic reactions, serious acute diseases, progressive neurologic diseases, uh, some recommended for pregnancy and young age, and um, in primary or secondary immunodeficiency, which is what we're going to emphasize today, and how gamma globulin may interfere with uh, immunizations. So, see, I'm going backwards. So, newborns, um, when you're first born, you get a hepatitis vaccine, um, hepatitis B vaccine, and then the next vaccine you get is oral rotavirus vaccine. Rotavirus causes a diarrhea disease. Um, it's of interest that. Um, 
rotavirus is given before children with severe combined immunodeficiency get sick, and there's been a number of serious uh, illnesses with rotavirus vaccine uh, in patients with um, um, severe combined immunodeficiency. The main vaccine that most of you have had is diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus. Diphtheria and tetanus are not much of a problem, but pertussis, as we'll talk about later, is a serious problem. Haemophilus influenza causes a respiratory disease and a big cause of pneumonia and uh, meningitis. That's given four times in the first year of life. And then, as is the pneumococcal polysaccharide, or conjugate vaccine called Prevnar. So, um, and then polio uh, virus inactivated. The SOC vaccine is given in the first year of life and seasonal influenza. So that poor little baby is gonna get a lot of shots in the first year, and it's expensive, but it's worthwhile. Uh, for vaccines at one to seven is the measles, mumps, and rubella, and varicella. These are live virus vaccines. And the reason that they're delayed is because the mother's maternal antibody uh, may prevent a good take from them if they're given before a year of life. Hepatitis A is recommended after 12 months and an annual flu shot, and then the boosters for the other vaccines, uh, hepatitis B, pneumococcus, uh, DPT, and, and, and uh, hemophilus. Then uh, from seven to 18, um, uh, you get a booster, but now um, they give a, um, a, a lower dose for diphtheria and pertussis because they're more reactive. In. The new thing is the meningi meningitis vaccine. You've probably heard that there is an epidemic of meningitis in uh, um, uh, UC Santa, uh, Santa Barbara and in Princeton, I think. And so that there was an old vaccine uh, that included uh, uh, four strains of um, uh, meningitis, but not type B. And that was the one that caused an epidemic. Well, just in the newspaper, I just read that they now are recommending that if you've got school-age kids, uh, entering college that that's a recommended vaccine now uh, to prevent uh, uh, meningococcal B. Um, boys and girls now are recommended for the papillomavirus vaccine, which is um, a, uh, it's a non, non live vaccine and it is very effective in preventing um, uh, cervical cancer, annual flu vaccine, and boosters for incomplete. Now, in our age, yearly influenza vaccine, a, DT, a Tdap, which is tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis, and used in adults every 10 years, and very important in pregnant women. We'll go into that in a bit. Um, meningeal vac meningococcal vaccine for college-age kids, and completing the other ones. Um, if you're over 60, you're recommended to have an influenza vaccine, and now they recommended that all patients get the childhood Prevnar vaccines for pneumococcus and also the booster, which is, contains 23. And we'll go into meningococcal va uh, pneumococcal vaccines in a minute. And then keeping your DTaP. It used to be that children gave pertussis to their older people now it's just the reverse. It's in, uh, adults with cough disease have, have pertussis and they expose their babies and their uh, children to it. Um, and then everyone over 60 should get uh, a shingles vaccine. A shingles vaccine is exactly the same as the varicella vaccine, but the dose is 14 times higher. And um, the, because shingles is gonna occur in about 50% of people over 60 without this vaccine. So that it's a very important vaccine. Um, so that you can see that that's, that's the lineup of vaccines. So now let's talk about what's really important to this group, vaccines in immunodeficiency and their family members. Well, patients that have a severe antibody deficiencies, these are patients with X-linked A gamma globulinemia common variable immunodeficiency, uh, hyper IgM syndrome, they should never get live virus vaccines. That includes measles, mumps, rubella, varicella, rotavirus, 
BCG, which we don't give in this country, which is a tuberculosis vaccine, and a type of influenza vaccine that's blown up into your nose, that's called flu mist, which is a very good vaccine, um, but it's a, it's a um, live virus vaccine, so it not, should not be used. It's really an interesting vaccine because it's cold adapted. It grows in the nose, but then if it goes into the chest, it gets inactivated, so it won't cause pneumonia. Um, every um, severe, uh, patients with um, uh, antibody deficiency on gamma globulin usually have antibody to most of these illnesses, so you don't need the vaccine. But the one exception is influenza, because influenza changes every year so gamma globulin, which is derived from antibodies from everyone else, doesn't have antibody to influenza. So even though you have um, no response to uh, uh, the vaccine, it may stimulate your cellular immunity. And so if you do get um, uh, exposed to influenza, you might get over it faster. So they recommend an inactivated vaccine for patients with severe antibody deficiency. Now, if you have a less severe antibody deficiency, and these include uh, selective IgA deficiency, um, patients with um, uh, subclass deficiency, or patients with um, um, selective antibody deficiency where you respond to proteins okay, but you don't respond to polysaccharides, there was a session on that. Um, it's recommended that all you can get most of the vaccines. They're, they're usually quite safe. Um, if you're getting IVIG, most of these vaccines won't work, and the exception, as I said, is influenza. Now, what if you have a cellular immunodeficiency where there's something wrong with your T cells, often in combi combined with an antibody defect? This would be patients with severe combined immunodeficiency, the complete DeGeorge syndrome or Wiscott Alder syndrome patients that often are candidates for transplants should not get any live virus vaccines, uh, and the inactivated vaccines probably are not going to work. Uh, the patients with a uh, touch of uh, immunodeficiency, partial combined immunodeficiency, like most DeGeorge patients, killed vaccines are okay. And a good rule is if your T cells are um, uh, greater than 300, you, you can go ahead and get the vaccine. Um, but BCG and vaccinia are not recommended. Okay, what if you have a phagocytic or complement defects? Uh, this is illnesses called chronic granulomatous disease. Um, uh, or having a complement defect, which are pretty rare diseases. Most of them have a normal immunologic response to antibodies, and so um, they do respond to um, vaccines, but they um, probably should not get a BCG vaccine or vaccinium. Um, in the rotavirus vaccine, most of these people will, won't be di diagnosed in the first year of life. So what about family members of patients that have um, immunodeficiency? You should keep your uh, vaccines up to date, including MMR and varicella va vaccines. Um, you should not get rotavirus. You should not get the um, rotavirus. You have a baby in the family. There's a possibility that the rotavirus vaccine could get into the immunodeficient patient. You should not get BCG, which is usually not a problem. And you should not get an activated, not get the nasal flu vaccine. You can get an inactivated influ influenza vaccine. But it's particularly important that you have your flu vaccine uh, updated, that you get a pertussis vaccine, the DTaP, and pneumococcal vaccine, and the shingles vaccine, because you're exposed to these people. The patients with immunodeficiency are exposed, so it's really important that family members get their vaccine. Now, if you're over 60, you should get your annual influenza vaccine. And nowadays, they recommend pneumococcal vaccine, uh, Prevnar vaccine, which is a protein vaccine. And so all people over 60 now, it's recommended that they get that, as well as the Zoster vaccine. Uh,
Herpes zoster, as you know, is caused by the same virus that causes chickenpox. It stays in the nerve root. Once you get a, a, a herpes vaccine, herpes illness, it's there for the rest of your life. And it reappears as you get older as uh, shingles, which are located. It's a very pain. Any of you have had shingles? Not fun, huh? Did you have the vaccine? No. No, okay. So it's of interest that uh, the shingles vaccine is not recommended for immunodeficiency, but the people that are likely to get shingles are people with a partial immunodeficiency, so it's a catch-22. However, uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine just uh, a month ago, there was an article about a new um, uh, recombinant uh, shingles vaccine that is dead. It, it, that won't cause disease that are, will be a great help. And that's particularly important for cancer patients because they're very susceptible for getting severe um, uh, herpes and shingles. And so this vaccine may well boost them and prevent uh, uh, shingles in these patients. So um, the vaccine is called Zostrafax. Um, and it's just the same as the uh, vaccine for chickenpox. So to prevent chickenpox, you need to have uh, antibody, and that will be stimulated by um, uh, the chickenpox vaccine. But to prevent shingles, you need cellular immunity. That's why you need a much bigger dose of that. The contraindications for the um, shingles vaccine are um, uh, immunosuppression and um, primary immunodeficiency and pregnancy. So let's talk a little bit about some specific diseases that are vaccine preventable. Uh, the rotavirus vaccine is a, uh, a, the most common cause of non-bloody diarrhea with fever and vomiting in infants. And in the world, it's a, one of the leading causes of death of children. So that there's now two oral vaccines that are given um, between two months and six months. They're called Rotatec or Rotarex. And as I said, that they are of risk to patients with severe combined immunodeficiency. And as you might have heard, there's a new program now for identifying patients with a severe combined immunodeficiency by doing cord blood testing and newborn screening. And one of the benefits of that is that these children that have severe combined immunodeficiency don't get the rotavirus vaccine. So this is a, a, a live virus vaccine. The contraindications are immunodeficiency, acute illness, intestinal tract disease, or severe combined immunodeficiency. And there was an earlier rotavirus vaccine which caused a gastrointestinal problem called indususception, but the new vaccines don't uh, have that problem. So rotavirus vaccines from two months to six months. Okay, polio vaccine. Um, as you know, there's two vaccines, the SOC, who discovered an inactivated polio virus vaccine. And then for a while, they switched over to the, um, the Sabin vaccine, which is a live attenuated vaccine. The problem with that is that a few patients that got the uh, live virus vaccine got uh, paralytic polio. One of the things that has happened with polio, it goes into the central nervous system and causes a severe illness. I just had a patient that um, with a 13-month-old boy comes, comes in with hemiparesis, like he's had a stroke. And they thought that he had um, multiple sclerosis, which can appear as an infant. So um, they did a spinal tap, and one of the diagnostic tests for multiple sclerosis, they have a high gamma globulin spike in their um, central uh, spinal fluid. Well, this boy had none. He didn't have a spike at all. He didn't even have any. So we sent him to the immunologist. We did a study on him, and he had no gamma globulin whatsoever. From the spinal flu, we, we glue, uh, grew out the, the uh, live virus polio vaccine, and he's paralyzed for life. Now, if you happen to have, if you're injured by a childhood vaccine, there's a compensation program uh, that will, the government will pay you to, uh, because of your, and this child did actually get $250,000, but it's nothing compared to his medical expenses. 
So the oral polio vaccine is used around the world. The advantage of the oral polio vaccine is you excrete it and people that are not immunized will get the disease and get the vaccine and they'll get it. So it gets you much better herd immunity. So most of the places in the world still use the oral polio vaccine. In our country, we always only we go back to the um, sock vaccine where you get uh, multiple injections. So as I said, the government has a vaccine compensation program. If a child has been injured by a childhood vaccine, the government will pay you. And you're paying for it because there's, there's a surcharge of 75 cents on every vaccine that's given, and that supports this particular program. Uh, pertussis, whooping cough, is making a comeback. It's um, a person with a cough as a characteristic um, severe cough that goes on and on and on. Babies whoop. They, after they cough, they make this terrible whooping noise, but adults don't have that. Um, but it's coming back. It's, it's a really uh, a mini epidemic since 2005. And the pre reason why, in the old days, you remember the old DTP vaccine caused seizures and sometimes um, uh, high fevers was very, very common. So they changed the vaccine. They made it much milder, and it's called um, um, acellular uh, pertussis vaccine. The problem is it doesn't work very well. It only lasts for three years, and that's why it's so it's important to get the people vaccinated and continue them. So they tried to do the right thing by making the vaccine weaker, um, but it doesn't last as long. And so many, many people, particularly in upper class neighborhoods don't want their kids immunized and so that they don't get the pertussis vaccine and so that's why it comes back. So one of the big areas that's really severe is um, uh, infants between zero and two months of age getting pertussis. It's a really, it can be a very fatal disease. And so it's recommended that all pregnant women get the pertussis vaccine, even if they had a, a pertussis vaccine in the just recent future because, as I said, the vaccine doesn't last long. So a pregnant woman um, should get pertussis vaccine to protect her baby, and any, any adult that takes care of this newborn baby should be, um, have the pertussis vaccine also. So they're working to develop a better vaccine um, and you can see the incidence of pertussis is increasing um, every single year. And it's really a mini epidemic in many areas of the country, including my own, which is, happens to be in West Los Angeles, where a lot of uh, Hollywood folks don't believe in vaccines. Um, so the, the standard vaccine for children is uh, tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis, high dose and they get um, five times in the first seven years of life and then boosters every 10 years. And the vaccine for adults is called um, low-dose diphtheria and um, uh, altered pertussis. And so uh, adolescents and adults should get that. So then we come to uh, influenza vaccines. There are many, there's six or seven different kinds of uh, parental vaccines. Uh, there's two kinds of uh, influenza, A and B, and so the inactivated usual kind of vaccines is um, <clears throat> the trivalent or the quadrivalent inactivated vaccine that's given yearly. However, for people over 65, there's a high dose that, that is more effective so that they should get that. Um, and the, a flu zone is inter given uh, intradermally. And then there's a new vaccine that it just is a jet stream. You get it uh, through a jet stream so there's no injection. And then there's two flu vaccines for people that are egg sensitive because this virus is grown on eggs. And indeed, as you heard, that there was a big chicken uh, 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 illness. And so they're worried that there's not enough eggs to make uh, the vaccine. And then there's this cold adapted um, flu mist vaccine that's given intranasally. Uh, <clears throat> the pneumococcal vaccine I want to say a word about. There's two kinds of pneumococcal vaccines. 
One is called PCV Prevnar 13, containing 13 different strains of pneumococcus. And then there's another one, a con uh, polysaccharide vaccine that contains 23 strains. Uh, the pro there's 100 different strains of pneumococcus, so you can get this disease over and over again. But the, uh, the PCV13 is the most common strains of pneumococcal disease, and the polysaccharide is, uh, contains all of those strains plus 10 additional ones. And so that there's an illness. How many went to the selective antibody deficiency? So you did. You know that this vaccine, particularly the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine, um, are for, can be used to test for patients that make antibodies to proteins, but they don't make antibodies to polysaccharides. And so that uh, and the, they tend to get a respiratory infections over and over again. So that the way to test for that is to give um, a child or an adult this uh, 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 vaccine, the polysaccharide vaccine called Pneumovax, and then check the titers. And there's a certain number of responses that you should get. So that it, it's very valuable to the immunologist to identify um, For children, they start using the Prevnar at um, 2 to 12 months of age, and then a fifth dose in 13 to 24, and then um, if you've been previously unimmunized, you get two vaccines of the Prevnar. A very good vaccine, but it doesn't cover all the strains, it covers 13 of them. And so they now give the pneumococcal polysaccharide to high-risk patients. Um, for adults, high-risk patients should get the um, uh, pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine and the Prevnar vaccine. And as I mentioned, it's used for diagnosis of um, uh, selective antibody deficiency. Let's talk a little bit more about influenza. Incubation period of one to four days, febrile illness, myalgia, headaches, cough, seasonal epidemics, pandemics, Serious in infants and aged. These are the two groups that die from influenza. As you know, um, the Spanish flu during the uh, First World War killed 10 times more people than was killed in the battlefield. It just wiped out people like mad. And there's three main types, A, B, and C. A and B are the ones that cause trouble. And um, it, it, as I mentioned, the Spanish flu killed 5% of the world's population, 100 million people. The bird flu um, it has affected 40 million birds. There's been an egg shortage now. The price of eggs is going up. And the flu vaccine, and um, uh, so that there may be a shortage of that kind of particular kind of flu. One of the things that's a new thing, that's fairly new, is that when you get influenza, there are antiviral agents that are quite good against it. And so especially an immunodeficient patient, if he, a suggestion of getting flu should go on these antivirals, Tamiflu. So nearly everybody should get the, the influenza vaccine. I uh, mentioned the meningococcal vaccine. Meningitis is, meningococcal meningitis is a really dreadful disease, a 25% mortality. And um, there's usually an ep epidemic among crowded teenagers, so like college students or military recruits. Um, and for certain immunodeficiency, if you have a complement deficiency, you're susceptible to this. And this is a big killer. And so there is a killed conjugate vaccine called Menactra that's given uh, for high-risk children, which would be immunodeficient patients. And there's um, a new vaccine for hepatitis, uh, for meningococcal type B. So any patient, that has a really high fever, you have to worry about this condition. I think we covered that. Okay. Human papillomavirus, I mentioned a little bit about that, causes cervical cancer, uh, anogenital and respiratory wart infection, is sexually transmitted, and 40% of adults are infected with papillomavirus. The, um, the, the vaccine is a non-infectious recombinant vaccine called Gardasol for females age 9 to 26. You should start using it before you get sexually active. 
three vaccines and uh, boys are now recommended to get this also. It reduces the cervical cancer fold eightfold, prevents genital wart, other strains may proliferate. It's very controversial. Some people think it, it makes girls more sexually active. They, this recent paper says it's not so, and now they all recommend it for males. So what about some concerns of vaccines? Well, long-term concerns like mercury or uh, the vaccines cause autism. That's been disproved. In fact, the um, person that, that said that from, um, from England had the paper refuted and, and it was complete medical nonsense. Medical vaccines overwhelm the immune system. Well, pertussis illness ca contains 3,000 different antigens and all of the flu and all of these vaccines put together are only 300. So getting a natural illness is much more challenging to the immune system. So the immune system can handle all kinds of things. So multiple vaccines don't overwhelm the immune system. Um, vaccines are not necessary because these diseases are rare. Remember, we're trying to get 95% of the people vaccinated so you get herd immunity. Uh, vaccines promote allergy. You know, one of the thoughts why um, uh, allergy is increasing because you live in a, such a clean environment. And uh, there's a recent paper, you might have heard about it, that um, the old days they said if you don't want to get peanut allergy, just avoid peanuts for the first two years. Now the thought is you should get peanuts early in life and then you become, you don't, um, become tolerant to them. And it's known, for example, that kids that go, live in a farmland have a less serious uh, incidence of asthma because they're uh, exposed to um, lots of antigens that the people living in uh, upper middle class existence don't do. And dude, they did this in East Germany, which is a rural area, and they had a very low incidence of asthma compared to West Germany. And then since uh, the countries reunited, uh, East Germany is becoming much more um, urban and uh, higher standard of evidence. The incidence of asthma is going up. So it's likely that, that getting people completely immunized may increase uh, uh, incidence of allergy. Um, costly, discomfort, multiple doctor visits, yes, that, that's the price we're going to pay for that. So in summary, vaccines have saved more lives than any other health and intervention except for a clean water supply. 16 recommended vaccines from birth to 18 years. Three vaccines for people over 60 include shingles, the pneumovax, and uh, the adult pertussis vaccine. For immunodeficient children, most killed vaccines are okay but may not respond. Uh, live viruses are contraindicated rotavirus, measles, mumps, rubella, vac vaccinia, flu mist, uh, and BCG. And family members, contacts should keep vaccines up to date. Um, patients on IVIG usually don't need or respond to vaccines, with the exception I said is influenza. So in summary, bring you up to date on a crime that's happened. A thief stole eight paintings from the Louvre. After careful planning, he avoids security, steals the paintings, and makes them safely to his van. However, he was captured two blocks away when his van ran out of gas. When the cop asked him, how could you mastermind such an amazing crime and then make sure and uh, make such an obvious error, he replied, Mansoor, that is the reason I stole the paintings, because I had no Monet. <laughs> to buy the gas, <laughs> to make the Van Gogh. I figure I had nothing to loot. <laughs> Do you have the gall to tell this to somebody else? That's it. Thank you.